Welcome, Crosswalk Online Church, to the second weekend in November. And I hope you survived election week. And whether your candidate was declared the victor or not, I trust that knowing that Jesus our Lord is king, it ultimately doesn't matter who is president. By the way, I think there's a scriptural verse that works well to help heal our polarized nation. And it's Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So, so often in our American political system, we gloat when we win and we rejoice when others are weeping and we're weeping when others are rejoicing. But how about this? Let the love of Jesus prevail and rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. God bless you. I want to take a moment and personally thank so many of you for your kind emails and cards that you've sent, offering your prayer support and wishing me well uh, during my cancer treatments. I deeply appreciate your thoughtfulness and your encouragement means a lot to me. So thank you very, very much, Crosswalkers. I wish I could see you and personally thank you. But I'm afraid as I gaze into the camera that some of you are worshiping the Lord this weekend in your pajamas. I mean, isn't that one of the beauties of online worship? We can worship the Lord in our PJs. Once when we were missionaries in Africa, um, we went on some photo safaris. Now, I don't shoot guns, you know. I only shoot photos. I shoot cameras. One morning, I got up so very, very early in the morning, I got a great shot of an elephant in my pajamas. How the elephant got in my pajamas, I'll never know. <laughs> uh, here's one. Do you know what kind of pajamas the devil wears? Satin, of course. <laughs> yes, Satan wears satin. Well, anyway, please fill out your online connection cards so we can, it's on our website, so that we can pray for you, so that we can rejoice with you. And it gives me my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this morning. Uh, he has given me a break to catch up on some administrative duties. And this is uh, Pastor Gilbert Foster. He is going to be our interim pastor, lead pastor, uh, leading us into a time of transition. He's going to lead um, our church council and our church staff, pastoral staff during this time. And honestly, I can think of no better person for the job. Gilbert is eminently qualified. You'll notice right away from his brogue that he hails from Scotland, my ancestral homeland. And uh, he's a fantastic proclaimer of the Lord's truth. And you are going to be blessed by Gilbert, by his wisdom, by his sense of humor, by his great communication skills. And this is a great weekend for us to worship the Lord together. So after um, a song of worship, we will welcome Gilbert. And uh, thank you. God bless you. Let me lead us in a short prayer. Lord, as we enter into a time of worship, we thank you that you are the Lord of the universe. And Lord, it doesn't matter ultimately who was elected this or that, because all these things are so temporary. Lord, you said your kingdom is not of this world. And so we rejoice in being a part of a kingdom that is so much greater than the things our senses can take in. Lord, we do know that you care deeply about this world that you made. And you care about policies. You care about policies that help people rather than hurt people. You care about leaders that exercise wisdom and compassion and honesty. And I pray, O oh God, that, um, that you would bless our country. That you would bless our future leadership. That you would fill us with a sense of your peace as we enter into 
our future. Lord, bless us as we continue to struggle as a nation and as a planet through this pandemic. So many people are hurting. And Lord, we weep with them. And we offer practical help in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you. And we pray that you would uh, guide us through the darkness that seems so pervasive in our land. Help us to remember that um, even though we must pass through some dark valleys, at the end, all is light, all is bright. And Lord, you are always there with us. So we love you, we worship you now, and prepare our hearts to hear your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. stories what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are who you are, who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for.
Well, good morning. It's a joy to speak to the congregation of Crosswalk Community Church in Sunnyvale. Um, The accent gives it away. I'm not from here. I'm from Chicago. Okay. Well, no, well, actually, actually, uh, I'm from the same heritage as Pastor John, Scotland. So all that's happened this past week, it's not my show. Okay. Uh, But today, I'm speaking to you from Clovis, California, and living in the Central Valley. It's it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from here. It's called Bakersfield. (laughs) As Pastor John prepares for his retirement, I've been working with John and with the board on preparing for the new era of ministry and mission at Crosswalk. And I wear the hat of the Director of Recruitment and Development for Growing Healthy Churches. And uh, I'm going to go a bit further than we would normally go. And starting in January, I'll be your transitioning interim pastor. And uh, I won't be there every Sunday, probably 50%. But we'll do some preaching and I will lead the staff and work with the board, even when not in Sunnyvale. And uh, very much looking forward to it. And... I know that transition is a time of mixed emotions and change is difficult. And I hope that I can help navigate with you through to the newness of what God has in store for you. And I hope, despite the sense of bereavement and loss at John not being your pastor, it will be also a time of excitement as the new is prepared for. So, We do all that still in the battle with the giant called COVID. Uh, So let's get to the main reason why I'm here today. Let's preach, okay? Uh, Open your Bibles to the scriptural testimony of how to deal with giants in our lives. And I want to look at the story that you probably or possibly know, the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And the story takes the whole chapter, 58 verses. So I'm not going to read it all, but I'll read some parts as I go, okay? And it begins with a very formidable guy by the name of Goliath. Listen to this, these words about him, verse 4 of chapter 17. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. (laughs) I think the Raiders would have loved to have had this guy on their team, okay? In, in fact, I think he might have made many of the Raiders look like, like exceedingly small and tulip-like, okay? Uh, this guy was a monster, okay? Uh, sorry, sorry, guys. I, I have this bad habit of always giving the Raiders a hard time. Like, like you know, like what, what do you call a drug ring in Oakland? A huddle. 
<laughs> I think I think that's funny. Okay, but but you know, like like how much does five thousand shekels weigh? One hundred and twenty six pounds, and that was just his coat. And he did what was a custom in war at this time. Look at verses 8 to 12. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine or are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And the enemy sends out their champion and challenge their opponents to send out their champion. And whoever that one wins, wins the battle. And the writer is painting a picture. And it's not that hard to join the dots to figure out. The people of God, Israel, are being threatened by a mean, menacing, intimidating giant. Now, Look at verse 16. The giant did not just come out once to challenge Israel, but every morning and every evening for the past many, many weeks, Goliath would come out and flaunt his size, show his strength, and dare someone to take him on. But isn't that how giants normally come to us? Whether it's the giant of worry, or the giant of fear, or the giant of loneliness, or the giant of out of control debt, or the giant of pornography, or the giant of self image, or the giant of a horrible loss, or the giant of an abusive spouse. They hammer on our hearts every morning, every evening, day in, day out, day in, day out, yelling into our souls, persisting, and intimidating. I'm grateful for one of my previous pastors that I sat under helping me understand this story. It is way more than a kid's story. So stay with me. This is one side of the picture. A big giant who wants to constantly hurt you. And the other side of the picture, on the other side of the Valley of Elah, the army of Israel, and they, <laughs> they are all scared silly, okay? And not just scared, but when you live dominated by a giant, you daily live with discouragement. Um, this guy has a neighbor, a farmer, and his neighbor, the farmer, is just never impressed by anything. He's a very discouraging guy. So the man gets the world's greatest hunting dog and he trains it to do remarkable things just to impress this discouraging neighbor. He teaches his dog to sniff scents from a mile away, to sit and point for an hour without moving a muscle. And he invites this farmer to go hunting with him. They go, and this dog does these remarkable things, but the farmer doesn't say a word. Finally, they're in a duck blind, and the guy shoots a duck, and it lands in the middle of the pond. He sends his dog, and the dog goes out, and the dog walks on the water, fetching the duck between his teeth. He walks with the duck across the water, walking on the water to the duck blind, drops the duck at his master's feet. <laughs> and the farmer looks over at the guy, the, the farmer who is, isn't impressed by anything, and he says, your dog can't swim, can he? <laughs> Here's the truth of my life. You and I know people just like that. And you and I have a little of that in me and a little of that in you. It is possible for humans to kind of slide into a chronic low scale or low grade discouragement that just doesn't go away and we're robbed of life. Now, now back to the story. Israel has its own giant, their king, their commander. 
This guy stood head and shoulders above every other Israelite, King Saul. He had been chosen because of his size and his stature. But Saul was a coward. And the best thing that he could come up with was a compensation package for any soldier in Israel who would fight Goliath. So look at verse 25. In verse 25, it talks about how uh, uh, the king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. <laughs> so, so he's not up for father of the year award, okay? <laughs> this, this guy, King Saul, was willing to give up his daughter to the guy who did what he was too scared to do. But Saul had a really ugly daughter <laughs> because no soldier of Israel was willing to take on Goliath. Come on. Even the wimpiest of full-blooded men would have fallen for a drop-dead gorgeous princess. And this is the story. Now picture what's going on. There's the giant, Goliath. There's the coward giant, Saul. And now the picture changes. The lens moves. And, and travel with me about 15 miles to Bethlehem. David is still with the sheep. But this boy, too young to go to war, left out again from the action, is about to enter the scene and change the destiny of Israel. The first giant that David has faced was the giant of delay. David was held back to care for the sheep. But then Jesse tells his son, look at verses 17 and 18, put together a bunch of food, David, and take it to your brothers who are fighting and find out how things are going. So come on with David into the valley of Elah. And the first thing you'll notice is the smell. It's a 15 mile hike with 10 cheeses in his backpack. <laughs> what a stink. <laughs> but there's a stronger smell. A stronger smell than the cheese floating around. David smells the fear. David has just arrived when Goliath comes out for his twice daily ritual of increasing the stinky odor of the Israelites. Come and get me, come and get me. Scare the cats, scare the cats. Na, 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 na. And the Israelites, verse 24, ran in fear. What a miserable way to live especially when you're meant to be an army defending your wives and your children and your land. But if you look down into many of our hearts this morning, we are often living lives immobilized by fear. We operate, I mean, we manage to get through the day. We, we do the work stuff and we bring in the paycheck. But who we are and what we could do and what our families could be like is debilitated by our fears and our giants who cause them. But fear can actually bring us a vital lesson if we're honest. It reminds us that we are inadequate. Life, in fact, is too much for us. Fear pushes us to decide on our view of reality. Here was Saul. He was a big guy with a big army, with David's big brothers all dressed, looking like fighters. They had routed the Philistines before. They had routed the Amalekites before. But now today, they are quivering wrecks, trying to bribe scared soldiers to take on Goliath. Saul and David's brothers have a Goliath-dominated imagination. Oh, the big guy. The big guy with his personal shield carrier, he's, he's going to get me. Oh, um, my father didn't account for much in life, neither will I. Oh, my mother was unlucky in love, so will I be. They always choose the better looking one, they'll never choose me. Oh, what's the, what's the point in trying to help solve the problem? My small contribution won't make any difference. And day in, day out, week in, 
week out, situation after situation, opportunity after opportunity, you face life with a Goliath-filled imagination. When tough choices come your way, you have so allowed your imagination to be dominated by your giants that you're immobilized in making the right choice, in being bold enough to make the strong choice, and you're frozen with fear. And David walks into the scene. He smells the fear. He feels the Goliath-dominated imagination of everyone around him. The valley was filled only with Goliath. And David says, what the blazes has happened to you all? Notice the response of his brother Eliab, verse 28. He, he tears strips off of David, accusing him of deceit and wickedness. <laughs> listen, listen. The moment we permit fear to control our imaginations, we become incapable of seeing the good, the true, the innocent. And if you cower before Goliath for too long, it eats away at your self-respect. Goliath-fearing people don't applaud bold people. Here's another giant that you or me often face, the giant of disapproval. But this is vital to understanding the David story. David starts from a different place than his brothers, than Saul, than the rest of Israel. For David, it is unthinkable to assess anything in life outside the rule and the reality of God. David has a God dominated imagination and giants didn't figure largely in David's understanding of the world. Look at verse 26. Who, says David, who is this ramble lookalike who should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 37, he's telling King Saul why he was able to go and fight Goliath. The Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear and he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there's not a single person listening to me this morning who does not want to have that kind of heart. I'm thinking we all want to have such a bold, God-dominated heart. And Saul replies, verses 32 and verses 33, don't be ridiculous. There's, there's no way you can go against this Philistine. You're only a boy. The giant of doubt. Doubt by others that you start believing about yourself. But King Saul didn't know something about little David. Eugene Peterson puts it brilliantly when he writes, David had practiced the presence of God so thoroughly that God's word, which he couldn't literally hear, was far more real to him than the lion's roar which he could hear. He had worshipped the majesty of God so continuously that God's love which he couldn't see was far more real to him than the bear's ferocity which he could see. His praying and singing, his meditation and adoration had shaped an imagination in him that set each sheep and lamb and each bear and lion into something large, vast, and robust. God. You can hear God is faithful a thousand times. And a lot of people have. And you can read or sing that God is faithful in a hundred books or in a hundred songs and lots of people have but you will only come to believe it down to the marrow of your bones and to know it when you test it day in, day out in your life. And so many of us, we don't test it out. When something hits us, we don't let God fix it. We fix it. We don't let God show his faithfulness. 
We borrow, we beg, we bury, we run, we do everything, we, pro we procrastinate, we, we do everything to get rid of the problem, the lion or the bear. We'll do everything to get rid of the problem, but wait for God to show us that he's faithful. Learn from David that if you're not saturating your daily routines, your 24-7 life with the reality of God, when a big giant stamps all over you, you will be incapacitated. You will be paralyzed with Goliath phobia. But here's something else. In a very real sense, when you go to face your Goliath, you stand alone. Look at the David story. David volunteers to go and fight Goliath and the king gets to hear of this offer and he's introduced to his future son-in-law, the winner of the prize of his daughter. And Saul now becomes well-intentioned. Saul knew he was a coward and that this young lad who most probably would be killed, might make it less of a slaughter if he had decent armor to wear. And so Saul offers him his own armor. Cowards can be very magnanimous in their cowering, even religion. Go and the Lord be with you. So you have this rather comical scene appearing in the text, verses 38 onwards. David tries on Saul's size 44 armor and David, he's only a size 32. Now watch the boldness of David's heart. He turns down the offer of the king's armor, not an easy thing to do. <laughs> you don't want to mess with a king who is already feeling guilty and weak. David removes the helmet, he unbelts the sword, he takes off the armor and he walks away from all the expertise, advice and the professional coaching. You see, borrowed armor is always a disaster. How many times do we do that? How many times do we copy what someone else did or take the route that someone else says worked for them or we buy and read book after book after book searching for the answer for something else but truly all we're doing is trying to relieve the pressure of us having to decide for ourselves. Too often the bottled answer or the bottled solution or the copied remedy is a disaster. All it has done is promote your own cowardliness, your own weakness. Here's the breakthrough that young David had that sadly so many of us go through life and miss entirely. It's okay to be only you. Don't allow you to become squeezed into the world's mold and you end up nothing like the you that God intended you to be. Huh. I read many theologians and, and many writers. And one of the writers that I enjoy is a man by the name of Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a party animal in New York and he was thoroughly secular and he, he chased with all of his energy the God of money, the God of status, the God of influence, the God of popularity, the God of greed. And his testimony is that God woke him up and he left New York and he lived in a Kentucky Trappist Monastery until his untimely death at the age of 53. One of his most helpful quotes says these words, if you find God with great ease, perhaps it's not God that you found. One day, a former professor of his who knew the, the old wild Tom of New York visited him at the monastery and he hadn't seen him for about 13 years. And he says this about the visit. Of course, Tom looked a little older. But as we sat and talked, I could see no important difference in him. And, and once I interrupted a reminiscence of, of, of his by laughing, Tom, Tom, I said, you haven't changed at all. Why would I? Tom said. Here 
Our duty is to be ourselves, not less. We become frightened and fearful and that if we get God, if we follow Jesus, we will become the person we most avoid, the, we, the person that we most dread, the person that we think the most crazy or they're dull or boring or bland or, and, and the joy and the fun and the laughter and the reckless will go. But maybe, maybe if we get God and if we follow Jesus, we will become the person we most want to be. As Soren Kierkegaard once said, maybe salvation is about becoming truly human. David, David walked down into the valley to face Goliath, living in admiration, not of King Saul, the earthly professional, but he walked down into that valley admiring God. Yes, he defeated the giant by remembering how God had helped him in the past. And yes, he defeated the giant by using what God had given him, his skills and talents and resources. Yes, he defeated the giant by ignoring the dream busters. But, and this is a defining moment in David's life. It's a defining moment in Goliath's life. It's a defining moment in the life of the people of God. He comes face to face with this giant called Goliath. And David is standing there with five small stones and a slingshot in his hand facing this monster of a warrior, this giant that everyone is scared to death of. But for David, because of his imagination and how he sees reality, there's only one giant in David's life and that giant is God. And this is not the story of David and Goliath. This is not the story of David and the giant. This is the story of David and the dwarf. Verse 48 says that David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet Goliath. Quickly, incredible. I I, I think as he was running, he was blinking and thinking, what giant, what giant? The only giant on this battlefield is God and he is within me and my God is omnipotent and if he's on my side, omnipotence can't lose. Story of a man who sees this little girl, tiny little girl holding a huge bag of popcorn and, and stuffing the popcorn into her mouth. And the man says, <laughs> like, like, how can a little girl like you eat all that popcorn? And she replied, well, you see, mister, I'm really much bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. <laughs> Brilliant! It, in, in a Goliath-dominated imagination, everything around you, your battles, your giants, are so much bigger than you. In a God-dominated imagination, compared to the size and the might of the one inside of you, everything is just a dwarf. David runs and David swirls his sling and the stone leaves his sling and hits Goliath right between the eyes. A guy by the name of Bill McGee said one time, Goliath's last thought as the rock hits him, was nothing like this ever entered my mind. (laughs) Friends, I don't know what your Goliath is. Maybe it's failure and you're paralyzed paralyzed by, by failure in your past life. Maybe it's a difficult person in your world. Maybe it's a job decision that you've been afraid to make. Maybe it's honesty or truthfulness that you've been afraid to stand up for. I don't know what it is. But I know this. That if you let your Goliath intimidate you, if you let him convince you that you are helpless, if you run away day after day after day, you will die a little day after day after day. But listen, your life is way too precious to God and the battle is too important. So if you turn 
And if you face your Goliath with one small stone wrapped in a confidence in God, your Goliath doesn't stand a chance. Let's pray. And as we quiet in our hearts, Lord, your spirit illuminates in our minds the giants that we face, the giants that we allow to terrorize us and dominate us and freeze us and fear us. And we each have them. For each of us, there is a battle that we constantly face. And there is a giant on that battlefield. But I pray, Lord, for every single person watching and listening this morning that they would come to have a God-dominated imagination, an understanding afresh of the faithfulness of God, the truthfulness of God, the power of God, the love of God, and realize that with a God-dominated imagination, there's only one giant. And it's him. And God wins. May you help us this week to change our thinking and to change our thinking by grasping how big and wide and magnificent is the God that we declare and the God that we call our Father. And as we pray, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us in a greater way. In Christ's amazing name. Amen. God bless. Death could not hold you, they'll torment.